Yeah, and I can see, and hopefully <laughs> the rest of you on online are able to see. Fantastic. And, and here, yeah. and if not, you just write in the comment field here. I can read that, and we start all over again. But I think I think it's okay. So please go ahead, Astrid. Thank you. Uh, well, my presentation is about. Uh, creating a home, decolonizing in everyday activities. Um, just to start, um, uh, I want to say a little bit first about what indigenous homemaking is and what a home is. Um, and uh, homes uh, are, as, a, as an object of study, is, is really interesting because it's also something that we often overlook, uh, even though it's such an kind of important part of our everyday lives and our identities and our social relations and activities. Uh, homes are spaces that traverse time. It's a link to the past and the future and to uh, earlier generations and and it's linked to uh, it's spaces that are kind of, yeah, they reflect places, both kind of uh, as a, in the local community, but also, also the nation. Uh, they reflect social status, uh, both economic, cultural status, et cetera. Uh, and they are dynamic social constructions that also are variously related to policies, places, families, kin, self, gender, feelings, journeys, and practices. So, as a kind of to study homes, you can also study quite kind of complex uh, relations, uh, both kind of on kind of a person to person person relationship, but also to to the nation and to to the global relations of the world. And that's also why I think this this project uh, called In the Home Project is is so interested. It's a project that started. Uh, now in December, uh, we have just started kind of preparing the uh, all kind of the practical work. We're trying to hire two PhD students now, uh, and we also have uh, researchers uh, here at uh, Nord University and Nolan Research Institute, Umeå University, Danish Institute for International Studies, and Greenland University. Uh, and it's a comparative project where we study homes both in the past and present, with special focus on the post-war period uh, and up until kind of today. Uh, and it's a comparative project also in terms of uh, that we study homes, both in, uh, in indigenous homes, both uh, here in Norway and in Sweden, uh, but also in Greenland and Inuit homemaking in the past and present and how that also has changed. Um, if we just look at the project objectives, uh, we have one part that is kind of the historic part that focus on housing policies, uh, historic housing policies and welfare policies in post-war Scandinavia, uh, where we also see how kind of housing policies also has been a way of, of uh, is a kind of soft assimilation, even though that wasn't often the kind of the main articulated intentions of these policies. Uh, we see that kind of a lot of the housing policies had the effect that it was an efficient way of uh, integrating indigenous people in this kind of large Scandinavian welfare project, creating kind of this perfect uh, welfare society. Uh, but of course, on uh, non-indigenous uh, terms. Uh, so, so this is also something, that is also why we have this kind of historic uh, focus as well as this more present day focus on homemaking. And we also have the, the part where we also uh, look on kind of how homemaking as a practice has also been a way of, of uh, as a kind of intervention in everyday life for, for, for people through their activities, through uh, interior, through uh, uh, for example, handicraft, through food uh, preparation, and through family relations, and as a, as a way of also resisting for elimination of indigenous cultures. And this is also something that we can see both in the past and present, 
Uh, I think that um, when looking at kind of the historic assimilation policies, for example, here in Norway, we see that uh, even though uh, apparently the Sami language and culture disappeared in a lot of communities, the, the fact was that it was often kind of privatized, that it, it stayed within the families, within the home. And a lot of people even today have this kind of link to, to the Sami heritage, even though they kind of, from an outside perspective, might not kind of seem as kind of a part of the majority of societies. I think that's also something that is interesting. But it's also interesting because there is kind of, to study also the diversity of, of indigenous societies. For example, here from a Sami point of view, we, we see that that a Sami home can be quite different. If you're a ranger herder, if you if you live in a city such as I do, if you uh, if you uh, if you live in a kind of small uh, community by the coast, uh, if you if you are doing fishing, for example, uh, and all and all this kind of diversity also reflect the home. Um, and, and, and that, that's also why I think it's interesting to study this also from kind of this kind of cultural resilience point of view, because uh, I think it's also important to, 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 to study kind of also how, how this can be used also politically to, to, uh, to both kind of to empower people, to, to create kind of a sense of, of belonging to one's place and to um, once um, kind of the community, but also to to kind of um, uh, create kind of new discussions about what it is to be indigenous today, and how this is also linked to to everyday life practices, not only kind of what you do on on the Sami National Day, for example, but what you do in in everyday life, through, for example, raising children. Uh, uh, cooking food um, um, through, for example, pictures of your family or, uh, for example, artwork, etc. And how this also can be kind of a way of giving hope and visions for, for a new future uh, where indigenous uh, language and culture can be also more present in, in, in people's lives. Um, but back to this, this focus on on uh, the link between indigenous homes and welfare states. I think that kind of homes, even though kind of internationally, the link between indigenous people and homes often is, is kind of understood in, in relation to, for example, the, the social problem of homelessness. Uh, this is not a, really a big social problem, for example, among Sami people, even though there, there might exist homeless Sami people as well, it's not really a, a big social problem that is 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 uh, is uh, termed a kind of political problem because of the welfare society that that we live in. Uh, but at the same time, it 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 we need to kind of address also how this welfare policies and how this housing policy, even though a lot of indigenous people themselves also, of course, of course, like to have a good home and to have kind of uh, a proper house. Uh, we also need to kind of acknowledge the way these policies in the past and present has changed indigenous homes and, and communities drastically. Uh, and, and while welfare is often understood to be something good, we see that also this has kind of uh, reinforced also the domination uh, of the states uh, over indigenous lives. Um, but of course, it's, it's also Quite, if you see, look at the Sami situation, we see that also uh, the different policies in the past also uh, have an effect on, on, on homes today. Uh, for example, in Norway, we have had this kind of assimilation policies from the 1850s, and maybe until some say even up until the 1980s. And some say that it never really ended because it kind of the effects of these policies still exist today as, and is also reinforced by uh, kind of the welfare states and its institutions. If you see at Sweden, it's they had a totally different uh, policy, and you also had this more segregation policies that you segregated different groups of Sami. Uh, this lap shall be lap uh, policy, where kind of the 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 so-called kind of purest Sami people were kind of segregated from the rest and from from the Swedish society. 
And, and I think that these policies, because we also focus on kind of the, this uh, comparative perspective between Sami people in Norway and Sweden and, and Inuit people in Greenland, kind of the, the similarities and differences also is, is quite interesting. Um, to continue with some, some examples, both kind of historically and, and today, on how this kind of uh, has changed Sami communities. Kind of one of the most kind of extreme examples is, of course, World War II uh, and, and kind of the evacuation, burning, and rebuilding of Finnmark and Northern Troms. Uh, as, uh, of course, some of you in, in, in the Norwegian context know, uh, the Germans kind of burned down all the houses in Northern Troms and most of Finnmark during World War II as a part of kind of when the Soviet Union attacked uh, from the east. Uh, and all, all the people, of course, had to evacuate and some hide in the, hid in the, in the mountains and in, in uh, but, but uh, a lot of communities were kind of completely destroyed and, and evacuated, uh, including, for example, my own family, where they kind of were, um, they, they were in the fact kind of, kind of, kind of fugitives for, for two years before they could return to their homes. But of course, the homes weren't there anymore. And that's also the, the thing that is, this was kind of the, the kind of extreme, um, extreme experiment in a sense from it gave also an opportunity for for the state also to to modernize uh, the this region that was uh, was kind of considered to be kind of uncivilized backwards and 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 kind of primitive where where they weren't really people weren't li living um, in accordance with kind of this ideal about kind of the modern society that a lot of kind of politicians in the South wanted to kind of imagine this to be. Uh, this is some examples of kind of traditional buildings, even though we can see, for example, in these pictures that there has been also transition from kind of this more kind of um, very kind of simple turf huts to more kind of almost like kind of modern buildings with windows and with, uh, with heat, kind of heating systems and with with a lot of kind of facilities, even though it was kind of traditionally. Uh, but we see um, this rebuilding on Finnmark also drastically changed how people, people were supposed to have kind of normal homes. And it was kind of standardized houses that was created by architects in the South. Uh, and, and this was kind of something that was, was also often linked to, to centralization and to modernization and to, to kind of creating this kind of modern communities in the North with, uh, with, with uh, industry, for example, fishing industry and, and where these houses also became kind of also a symbol of, of this kind of prosperous future for the region. And of course, a lot of people uh, were happy of getting kind of modern houses, but I've also heard, for example, that uh, for, for example, elderly people saying that the, the new houses they weren't as kind of uh, they weren't as warm and cozy as, as the old ones. Those who still remembered, for example, that that their grandparents had kind of lived grown up in in turf huts. They said that well, it was kind of it, they 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 lost something on the way, even though these houses were kind of. Uh, bigger and they were more comfortable and they had kind of more kind of comfort regarding kind of furniture and things like that and they also get kind of support from from the state to build these houses um, and the interesting thing is that we also see kind of a parallel uh, in in the modernization of Greenland even though it was it was kind of done and um, in a different way they didn't really have kind of uh, villages that were burned down but uh, and, and this is also something that we want to explore in the project, uh, that were there any links between the architects that build this kind of, uh, this, uh, this um, new houses in Finnmark, for example, and the architects that create this, this, this uh, modern houses that, that were supposed to kind of modernize Greenland. Um, and and I, I think that we definitely can find some links, even though kind of it's maybe, uh, it's indirect in a sense, but they were part of also a community of architects that that had some visions and some politicians on national level that also 
had kind of a shared sense of what the kind of the new Scandinavia should be. Um, that also involved kind of a drastic change of indigenous communities. Uh, and I think that kind of this, this perspective of colonization is also something that um, is interesting in this way because, um, and for example, Vele uh, Petrika Lethola says that kind of the way colonization has been understood uh, within the Scandinavian countries is often that, for example, the Sami people, they were kind of colonized almost as a kind of natural process. It just happened because they were weaker and they were kind of run off by, over by a stronger people. And it wasn't really uh, kind of the intention to colonize. It was just kind of the, um, the <laughs> as a, almost like a kind of a law of nature uh, that they were just run over by a modern, modern society. And they had to be modern in order to kind of function as, in, as human beings. And it was almost like a kind of inescapable fate. And I think that this is also something that we can see uh, today and the way kind of the colonization of, of, of Sakmi is, is um, understood because it's, 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 even though it was quite different from, for example, colonization of, of other uh, parts of the world where you can have kind of a, a specific date for the arrival of the colonizers. It was of course a more gradual process. Uh, but I think that kind of to look at this 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 housing policies and also how that kind of had an um, effect on on people's life is also a way of of, of trying to kind of reconstruct and and uh, and, um, and, uh, and 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 find a new way of, of of creating kind of an understanding of, of the of the situation uh, that is different from this kind of almost like kind of this it was kind of an inescapable fate as I said. Um, and I think um, this, what kind of, rather than talking about homelessness, I think that kind of what a lot of people are kind of maybe experiencing uh, today is also a sense of rootlessness, a lack of sense of home due to um, all this uh, welfare policies and assimilation policies. And it's kind of uh, that the kind of, the way a lot of Sami communities were based historically was also linked to um, kind of a, a also a nomadic lifestyle for reindeer herders, but also for for other parts of, of Sami communities. This 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 sense of home was linked to more than just kind of the house and 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 your own kind of uh, yeah parents and children. It was linked to the, to, to nature, to communities, to activities. Um, and also stories about different places that were moved through as an integrated part of the sense of home. And also the loss of land and loss of kind of old settlements uh, that is a part of a lot of the history of a lot of Sami people today, whether it is kind of forced resettlement or kind of more kind of soft uh, uh, influence on people where kind of they, they move to a bigger place to, to get a job or to get a better place to live in a better house, etc. It's still kind of linked to this kind of loss of, 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 of land and loss of old settlements as a part of colonization. And where also these homes and houses also uh, represent uh, this, this, this uh, loss in a sense, where, where people have to kind of, kind of rediscover who they are in, in, in new ways, while at the same time um, kind of uh, having to, to deal with this kind of responsibility of, of, uh, of um, yeah, taking care of, of uh, one's own future in a sense. And, and, and I think that also to, to talk about homes as houses uh, also privileges certain societal interests at the expense of others. And the way we also talk about homes from a very kind of majority state uh, point of view often miss how homes can be a much more complex phenomenon from uh, an indigenous point of view. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. I have thousands of slides, but uh, that's how it is. <laughs> Any questions? Brilliant. Very interesting. Yeah, but we'll see. Have, do we have any questions? 
I will be happy to come with the microphone. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, talk. Um, I was my my question is about um, so you talked about uh, the housing policies of the welfare state as 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 a, a way to um, certainly provide for some physical needs, especially after the war, but also to to intrude and, and regulate and discipline sort of indigenous li 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 living. I'm wondering some of the things you mentioned most recently, especially like the soft soft power to get people to move rather than a forced relocation. If it might be tied to um, pro increased prosperity in, in the Nordic region in general, but particularly in Norway uh, in, in the post-war period, of, of which was becoming fabulously wealthy, and and if that might not also be sort of a soft power of assimilation, but um, if you had thoughts on that, or if that's if that's part of your project at all. Yeah, I think that definitely is uh, an aspect of this. We haven't really uh, kind of focused on that uh, kind of up until now, but we're still kind of in the early phase of the project. So I think that that definitely will be a topic for discussion later, but uh, I don't really have an answer yet because we don't really have that much data, uh, but uh, hopefully that will be. I think that's uh, kind of, and that's also kind of the dilemmas of this, that is, it's, and I think also that well, that that was something that we will find in a lot of a lot of the interviews that this this ambivalence that people have, and I see that also in my own family, kind of that they were when they returned from uh, from um, from the south back to Finnmark after the world World War II, it was they were happy to get new homes and to relocate and get a job, and uh, yeah, they they the children didn't have to go to. Uh, uh, residential school anymore they could live with their parents and it was a lot of kind of good things but at the same time they they grew up in a community that was kind of defined by the Norwegian state and the Norwegian culture and language and that they kind of that they they, they had to kind of I think that a lot of people also uh, and that that's that's something that I also find interesting that still today people have kind of even though it's not nomadic in the traditional sense, a lot of people have have kind of they they feel they, they feel a connection to, to to several homes of of themselves and their ancestors, and they go back to the old communities uh, that maybe no one really lives anymore. We have, for example, here in in Norland, uh, uh, the 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 almost kind of this this housing policies in the sixties, for example, in Tysjord and other places where people were kind of relocated to to larger settlements where they had they got kind of support to big uh, build better houses uh, and but while still this kind of old communities that where most aren't really uh, they don't really have any kind of inhabitants per se but they they have a lot of people that still uses these houses as homes even though it's only part of Part of the year, and especially in the summer, for example, where the family gather and and uh, get together in 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 this kind of old settlements that were that still has a great importance for a lot of people, and this is also a way of kind of uh, creating a link to the past, even though they kind of yeah. But it's interesting, and I heard some of these stories before from another context when we many years ago interviewed people. Uh, affected by the late industrialization in northern Sweden, that people that were moved or more or less forced to move from the north to the south. And we interviewed the women, which no, no one ever done before. <laughs> and how was it to move from the north, from, from home to uh, something else, rootlessness or whatever? And they said exactly what you say. It was very nice because <laughs> The quality of standard increased a lot. We had tap water in, running tap water inside. The, the school children could go to school just around the corner. And that was something else. And no one had asked them. So are there any kind of hidden narratives in this that you kind of uncover? Or that's one of my questions. The other is that aren't we in the Nordic countries in general also more like multi 
kind of feeling at home because we are also countries that are um, very much influenced by the idea of having a second home, not, or not mm -hmm. only um, the Sami, but in general. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think that's also why kind of this kind of this, this Sami way of having several homes, whether it is also also kind of, for example, reindeer herders, but also people that have several homes. I know that, for example, the people here in Buda have, they have a home here in Buda and they have a home in, for example, Tysjord, and then they have the, the family, old, old settlement, the whole house, and, and they kind of move between all these places all the time. And it's, uh, and, and maybe if they're, for example, like my family have, they kind of a lot of my dad and his cousins, they have, the, dad's cousins, they have houses, for example, in Spain where kind of you have kind of five or six cousins living in the same street as a as a way that's also a part of their kind of this uh, yeah weird modern nomadic lifestyle where where several homes can be uh, while at the same time kind of connecting to some sense of home also in the past and to the, the family and community and i think that's that's kind of that's maybe why it's not seen as that kind of the, that weird from a Sami point of view, for, for a majority point of view, because a lot of Norwegians have uh, cabins in the mountains as well. Uh, but I think that kind of, it's, it's, um, it's still something different because kind of to, to, to go back to, to a home that was kind of your, your ancestors home in the past and to a place where you have kind of your, your ancestors and your family have stayed for generations. It's, it's something different than just kind of buying a cabin and. Uh, oh yes, I agree. But I, I mean, to yeah. some extent, there are yeah. some second home owners yeah. that have as the the old family form yeah. as the second home. Yeah. That is a, a way of connecting to the roots. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Austria. I'm very fascinated about how many different perspective actually the little world home can <laughs> generate because i was thinking about one thing is the building the importance of that and how it influences how they interact within the building and the life they get because you get all separate rooms for example just that mm -hmm. changed a lot from being in the gumba for example where everybody is together or all the time inside at least and also uh, the difference between the importance of the building as such compared to the importance of the place mm. is the place the most important maybe it's different for different people yeah and the lifestyles and the bigger communities and sometimes when particularly related to homes i get some kind of parallel of course it was much bigger for the uh, sami people the influence but there are definitely some parallels for example to helgeland coastline where they forced people to move away for from their houses on the smaller islands for example outside verga where they now have this eider duck culture which gave the world heritage status mm -hmm. actually it always almost was dead the whole culture because of these uh, uh, national policy from the 50s up because they wanted people to move into Muirana and Mushan to become industry workers, which is so extremely big difference from living out in the, the, the islands with the fishing and small farms and everything and into these factories and towns. So, yeah, I, so I, I really could have, it would have been very interesting to do some kind of comparative study there. I think yeah. there is something there that we could do something about. So good luck with the rest of the work and I <laughs> hope, look forward to hear more. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. I think we should sum up or I will see if we have, have the next presenter now. Who oh, could that be? <laughs> Yeah. 
as it were. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> nice to be here. Um, yeah, 